Good morning. Today I am reading chapter 15 from Warriors Don't Cry. And after the chapter has been read, you need to complete a journal entry for chapter 15. Please remember to complete that in complete sentences, answer the prompt, and make sure you refer to the quote. I am giving you a quote for this journal entry. This is not going to be a choose your own quote. This is going to be a quote designated by myself, and you need to respond to the prompt given. If you have any questions, please email me. Okay, chapter 15 begins on page 174. Please remember to sit up, have your book in your hands, and pay attention as I read the chapter to you. I gunned the engine of Link's car and began moving as fast as I could without attracting too much attention. By the time I rounded the corner at 12th and Cross and headed for the backyard, I felt myself going out of control. The car careened into our yard. I was moving so fast that I knocked down the fence my Uncle Charlie had begun to build around Grandma India's flower garden. Have you lost your mind, girl? Grandma said, wiping her hands on her apron just as she held the screen door open and peered into the backyard. What's going on? Whose car is that? She was stretching to see past me. Uh, it belongs to a friend, a school friend. Let me in. I motioned her to back away and then carefully latched the screen and locked the door behind me. Pulling the curtain back from the glass peephole in the door, I took one last look to see whether or not someone was following me. I started to tell Grandma what happened. Page 175. You mean to tell me that car belongs to some Central High white boy? She was horrified. I tried to calm her as I explained, but the expression on her face turned from astonishment to fear. Suddenly, she hurried to the linen closet and started frantically searching for something. She pulled out several torn and faded sheets and a whole bunch of safety pins. Dragging me with her, she rushed out the back door. We squared off the first sheet, holding its corners the way we did to make the big bed in Mama's room, and then pulled it across the hood of the car. Maybe you'll live to see tomorrow if we can hide this car from the police. She motioned me to help her stretch the second sheet across the roof of the car. I suppose you were stuck twixt the devil and the deep blue sea, child. You done your best, but we got us some real trouble now. We rushed into the house and locked the door behind us. When Mother Lois came home from teaching, she was just as upset as Grandma. After lots of questions and lots of pacing, she calmed down a bit. Well, maybe this isn't so bad after all, she said. It's been a while and nobody's come to inquire about the car yet. Grandma put her hands on Mother's shoulders and said, Perhaps the boy was telling the truth. Who's to say that he can't be one of God's good white people? I suppose, Mother said as her frown eased a bit. Let's assume for a moment that this boy wasn't trying to trap you. How are you going to get his car back to him without other people finding out about it? Link said he'd call. I replied as I began to search for ways of returning the car if he didn't. I surely couldn't drive it back to school the next day. He couldn't be seen, page 176, he couldn't be seen in my neighborhood, and I dared not travel in his, especially not at night. Well, we would have to figure out a secret way. When the phone rang, I raced to pick, it up, the, to pick up the receiver. Hi, it's Link. How do I know it's you? My keychain has a little gold football on it. Okay, thank you, Link. Thank you very much. Andy swears he's going to get you next time. Yeah, he frightens me. Look, we better hurry and get this car thing over with. Andy is suspicious that you drove away in my car. I told him no, it's a coincidence, that it looked like mine. But I need to make sure he sees me driving my car. Whatever you say, I whispered a prayer that Andy hadn't called the police. Why don't you drop it off in front of Double Deck Ice Cream? Nobody would give it a second thought if we were there at the same time. Why did you do it? My curiosity was killing me. I had to ask because he was real serious about killing you. Don't take his threats lightly. He means it. Hey, gotta go. Be there in a half an hour. We couldn't risk asking a neighbor's help, so even though I didn't have a license, I had to drive Link's car downtown. I wondered what he must be like. The inside, I, the inside of the car was what Conrad called cherry. Clean and polished as if he washed it twice a week. The record albums on the back seat were the same ones I might have chosen. Johnny Mathis, Sam Cooke, Elvis, and Pat Boone. Who was Link anyhow? Page 177. Suddenly, I felt frightened. Maybe he was a member of the clan. Maybe they were waiting with him for me to bring his car back, and they were going to grab me. I concentrated on my driving to get rid of those thoughts. I pulled up in front of Double Deck Ice Cream. 
Mama was right behind me. I looked all around to make certain there were no central students who might recognize me. I parked Link's car at the curb, a little ways down from the front entryway. After leaving the keys beneath the floor mat on the driver's side, I walked back to our car. I couldn't resist taking a quick look around to see if I could spot Link. If he was there, I couldn't see him. I climbed into the passenger side of our car, and we were safely on our way home. The next day, when I saw Andy, he was walking past Mrs. Huckabee's office. There were two other teachers standing nearby. So although he growled at me, threatening that he would get me before the day was over, he kept walking. Each time I passed Link in the hallway, he winked at me. It was the one kind gesture in the morning filled with hellish activity. In the days that followed, every time I saw Link, he acknowledged me in some way. His wink or pleasant expression sometimes came just at the, the moment I needed to know, to know I was alive and valuable. March 23rd, the AME churches gave the eight of us white Bibles with our names engraved on them during afternoon services. It made me feel like my people are supporting me. Page 178. En route to lunch the next day, as I approached my locker, I noticed the door was open. Someone had hammered the lock and dumped out my books. I had to go to Mrs. Huckabee's office to report the incident. I would need new books for afternoon class, and I would miss being with my friends for the full lunch period. I walked into the cafeteria after reporting my loss to Mrs. Huckabee and getting new books to find that my friends had already left. I wondered why they had left early. Could it be that they had gone to look for me? As I settled down in my seat and began to unwrap the sandwich Grandma had made for me, I noticed a group of boys moving in close to me much closer than usual. There had always been a wide path of empty chairs immediately surrounding our eating area because other students shunned us during the lunch period. Maybe they felt free to harass me so openly because this was one of those days when school officials were experimenting, seeing whether or not we could survive without uniformed federalized troops or school officials posted where everyone could see them. There were no guards in the halls when we changed classes, no guards just outside the cafeteria doors within shouting distance, as they often were. There were no officials pacing the floor or hugging the walls, observing what was going on. I began to get nervous. I could tell it was no accident that I was being surrounded by the group of sideburners who appeared to have mischievous plans for me. As I looked around, suddenly I saw him. There was Link, seated among my attackers, laughing, joking with them, behaving as though he were a regular member of the group. I studied him, waiting for his eyes to catch mine, and when they did, he looked down quickly. It both frightened and saddened me to see Link among those hoodlums. I stared at him in disbelief and anger. Had he pretended to be a nice person when he was just one of them? I struggled to regain my composure. As usual, I was seated near the main entryway with my back as near to the wall as I could get so that my rear would be protected. But with those boys becoming more vocally hostile every moment and the guards absent, my safe seat seemed to be a trap. I looked off into the distance where some of my people were serving food from behind the counter. There was no way any of them could help me. There must have been a thousand or so students in that huge room. It was near the beginning of the second lunch period, a time when the cafeteria was most crowded. Even above the ear-shattering levels of conversation that blended into a hodgepodge of unsettling noise, I could hear my attackers' comments shouted at me over and over again. They were saying how they were going to come and get me and what they would do with me. I was trying to ignore them, concentrating instead on a plan for my escape when a milk carton came flying at me, hitting me on the forehead. It was followed by something that pierced my cheek. It took me a moment to realize one of the boys had a bean shooter. I flinched, but braced myself so I would not show a reaction even though the prick was painful. I ducked down quickly to avoid a hard white object that came whizzing through the air. I narrowly averted, page 180, the missile, and when I reached to examine it, I found a golf ball wrapped in paper. Remembering my discussion with Grandma about playing mind games, I examined it as if it were a pre precious treasure. I smiled and gushed loud enough for those sitting closest to me to hear, it's just beautiful, thank you, it's just what I need. My hecklers began mumbling among themselves. They were far enough away and I, that I couldn't hear exactly what they were saying, but I watched the puzzled expressions on their faces. They looked at me as if I had lost my mind. I glanced at Link to see his reaction. It was hard to read. I had to stop wondering about Link and figure out what to do.
don't do anything, the voice in my head kept repeating. Recently, school officials had issued a warning about students who initiated attacks. The penalty was suspension. I suspected that as long as I remained in my seat, no one was going to walk over and dump soup on my head or attack me. With all those other students seated close enough to watch what was going on, my attackers would want it to appear that I made the first move, forcing them to retaliate. When the bell rang, the room became even more noisy with people shoving chairs, finding their books, and rushing toward the exit. I desperately wanted to get out of there, but I knew I couldn't move or the group would start a fight and set me up for expulsion. For sure. Word was they had psychological experts training them in ways of forcing us to respond. I was willing to sit in that spot until the end of time rather than risk a fight. I was already wearing band-aids on my heels from the heel walkers the day before, and I was sore up and down the backs of my legs, page 181, from being kicked. I felt I couldn't take any more. I knew I couldn't help but fight back against the next person who attacked me. I pretended to become intensely involved in my book. I was reading about Mr. Gandhi's prison experience and how he quieted his fears and directed his thoughts so that his enemies were never really in charge of him. All at once, I was aware that one of my hecklers was coming toward me. N-words are stupid. They got to study real hard, don't they? He said in a loud voice. Thanks for the compliment, I said, looking at him with the pleasantest expression I could muster so he, wouldn't, so he would believe I wasn't annoyed. Study hard now, N-word, but you got to leave this place sometime, and then we got you. Thank you, I said again, a mask of fake cheer on my face. He seemed astonished as he slowly started to back away. I felt myself smiling inside. As Grandma India said, turning the other cheek could be difficult, but for me, it was also beginning to be a lot of fun. Somehow, I had won a round in a bizarre mental contest. My heart slowed its rapid beating, and my hand stopped shaking. I felt safer, even comfortable, as something inside me settled to its center. I had a powerful feeling of being in charge. I was no longer allowing, hecklers behave, longer allowing hecklers' behavior to frighten me into acting a certain way. For that moment, I was the one making decisions about how I would behave. A little choir of voices in my head was singing, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. The second bell rang for the beginning of the next, page 182, period. By that time, students were expected to be settled into their seats. I saw Link beckon the hecklers into a huddle. From the expressions on their faces, I could tell there was serious conversation about what to do next. All at once, the group, led by Link, made their way to the door. Hey, I'm not going to stay in detention hall every morning for a week just for a little N-word beating pleasure, I heard Link say as he passed close by me. I heard them arguing with one another, heard some of them agree that it would be worth it if they could get me once and for all. But I heard Link's voice as he said it was better to leave now and he'd help them get me for sure, for later, sure. Get me later for sure. All right, and that is the reading of chapter 15. Don't forget to please go now to your Google Classroom and complete the journal entry for chapter 15, which will also count as your attendance credit. If you have any questions, please email me. Have a wonderful day, guys. Bye-bye.